This video is about city growth and organization. Today we're going to be focusing on the three models that are used uh, most commonly for by geographers to describe the growth of uh, United States cities. And so the three that we'll be focusing on are the concentric zone model, or also known as the Burgess model, um, the sector model uh, that we'll be highlighting and in, in sometimes known as the Hoyt model, and then the multiple nuclei model, uh, sometimes known as the Ullman or the Harrison Ullman model. Uh, most often though you're going to hear multiple multiple uh, nuclei model. So let's get started. Uh, we'll start with the Burgess model or the uh, uh, concentric zone model. Basically it's highlighting a, a very traditional um, concentric rings around a central business district that as we look at the the density um, or the, 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 the sort of the gravity that is uh, brings uh, activity um, into um, you know, and supports the Kristaller's uh, central place theory. Um, you have the central, the CBD, followed by several rings around that that highlight the not only the changing in change in real estate value, um, but also po uh, density that we're going to see. And so, generally speaking, that first ring is central business district. The second, uh, or the second uh, ring is the or in that purple zone, is the zone of transition where you might see in some basic light industry or industrial zones or areas uh, com mixed with uh, low income or um, usually older uh, less viable housing situations oftentimes tenement housing um, the third ring becomes more uh, single-family independent working homes uh, where maybe you have uh, you know blue-collar um, working-class families uh, new immigrants um, singles uh, or, or people that are don't ha don't have a family yet you move beyond that you get into more residential areas and further yet into the fifth the commuter zone you basically we're in suburbia so just another quick uh, more close lo closer look to this and, and specifically looking at Chicago um, when Burgess developed this model in the 1920s he focused on that um, orange area the CBD and you know where there really isn't residential areas but there was a it's a hub of, of um, economic activity and in the the ring around it you're going to see if you know if there's housing it's generally poor quality um, because it's in areas where you're going to see uh, more ec still economic activity generally uh, manufacturing or industry and it's known as that zone of transition and once you go beyond that you start hitting the the more residential neighborhoods generally speaking the working class in the third ring um, in the fourth ring, you're seeing, you know, as the urban sprawl continues, you're going to see um, more uh, spacious lots, uh, bigger homes, uh, generally speaking, uh, higher income in terms of social status. And so one of the things that defines um, all these models are, is really the social class, uh, generally speaking, from lower, middle, and upper class uh, and in different ways, but highlighting these different um, economic realities in, in the models. You get to the outside, um, and and within some pockets, you're going to see the high income or the um, upper class housing areas. So just a quick image. This is just a, a, a image of um, that zone two or that transition where you can see uh, a little bit run down. You can see that some of this are you have a couple uh, family homes, probably multiple family homes, uh, tenement housing. Uh, you can see some boarded windows and such. The next model is the sector model, and that is going to be something that was developed. Um, you know that really, uh, when when Hoyt, uh, Homer Hoyt looked at the the Burgess model and he started applying it to Chicago, um, he noticed that there was some um, contradictions. That if we looked at the south side of Chicago, uh, those those high value, um, higher income families were not there. It was very poor, um, low income housing. And he developed this idea of a sector model, which basically said that this the model gets shaped based on transportation access um, and the types of uh, uh, economic activity that take place in some of the surrounding areas. And so if you look at the central business district, it's highlighted by the transportation industry that access to maybe rail lines or freeway systems are going to um, take precedent and define some of those areas. Um, not only does residential area will steer, steer clear, but those light industry manufacturing are going to try to gain access to it. Um, if we look at uh, you know the, the residential areas um, tend to surround it or 
and uh, again, sometimes along transportation routes. Um, and then the higher class residential maybe um, are going to usually have a, a, their own sort of wedge and be surrounded by middle class neighborhoods. Um, you know, maybe highlighting to, well, in the Twin Cities area, you could look at the west and in the lakes, you know, the going out, you know, from the from Lake Calhoun on, uh, the western suburbs define that um, very well for us. So again, looking at the, the model more specifically, 1939 Homer Hoyt, um, instead of having rings, there are more sectors or these wedge-shaped zones that kind of are defined by accessibility to, in particular, in industrial areas and transportation lines. Our last model that we'll be looking at in this particular video is our multiple nuclei model. And that is, is really highlighting the fact that um, in both cases, previously, you had some basis tied to the central business um, district. That you had, you know, at some point, getting, gaining access to that was a, a, a defining factor. In the multiple, multiple nuclei model, this is a very common one in the United States, um, as we have a, a little bit different development pattern that happens in urban areas. And this is where you, st this might be due to um, a university where uh, you might see different patterns of restaurants or fast food chains. Um, it could be near an airport where uh, industrial areas might develop because they want access to um, uh, those that transportation node, yet it's not necessarily near a central business district because of noise, tr um, air traffic, etc. And that's also going to find then the residential areas or surrounding it. And so basically what you have are these small pocket areas that surround um, various elements of that we've highlighted before, but not in a concentric way or even in a sector way. But it's more complex, it's more varied, um, and, it, and it, it can vary from city to city what might define those areas. In the Twin Cities, we have um, uh, edge cities where you have, you know, based on the, the, the band or the, the belt lines of the major, major freeway networks, and where those intersections take place, we see buildup. Um, we see uh, a density of, of commercial areas. Um, uh, you know, they call it the multiplier effect. Where you, you know, that and uh, highlighting the the, the buildup of the different services, restaurants um, along those areas where um, we have those prime intersections. So, again, briefly, just going back to our first slide. Um, you know, three models that you should be aware of for the U.S. development of U.S. cities are this concentric zone model or the Burgess model, the sector model or the Hoyt model, and then the multiple nuclei model.